Please stand and join me in the call to worship that you'll find in your bulletin. <clears throat> o come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the, For the Lord, Lord is a great God, God and a great King above all gods. all gods. Father God, we praise you this morning. We praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to us. Um, we praise you, Spirit, for living in us, for dwelling among us, for empowering us with strength to live each day for your glory, for your purposes. We pray that as we gather and worship this morning, we would know your work in us, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to hear from you this morning and return back with praise. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in singing hymn number five, Come Thou Mighty King. <coughs> to God in prayer and silent confession. Father, we come to you today as a sinful people. We have knowingly turned from you. We have done things. We have thought things. We have submitted to things we know are filled with darkness and not with your light. <coughs> Give us the capacity to see our sins. Give us the desire to come to you again and again, over and over, in repentance for what we have done that is not pleasing to you. We confess our sins before you now in silence. We pray together. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done. Spare those who confess their faults and restore those who are penitent according to the grace given to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. Friends, through faith, we can be assured that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. to power hour and are enjoying learning and growing with Jesus there, but I don't know if there's any kids that want to come down and join me in the front. Oh, you're going to go, okay. <laughs> I could give this to her in the car on the way home. We're going to do it so everyone can share. This, um, this children's sermon is called The Holy Spirit's Like an Air Mattress. So sometimes our family has gone camping or we have a lot of we have sleepovers with friends or family will come and visit. And what do you think it's like if I just put out the air mattress in your bedroom and said, and didn't blow it up and just said, sleep there? It's pretty flat, right? Like that doesn't really work. It's deflated. It doesn't have an essential thing that actually makes it do its job, right? So when you put that, what, what, what usually happens is the dad will go, I'll call daddy and tell him to do it, right? And we'll, he'll go up and he'll blow up the air mattress and he'll fill that air mattress with air. And something that was just this flat thing that wouldn't have done any good and actually would be uncomfortable to lie on becomes a magic mattress. And we call it a bubble bed in our house, right? And then you can sleep on it and it has power. It can hold a lot of weight. Sometimes we even test the limits of that weight, right? But um, the air mattresses don't work as air mattresses unless they're filled up. And today we're talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is what gives us the power to do the things that God has called us to do. It is God not only just with us like a friend, and that is the Holy Spirit is a friend and a companion, but the Holy Spirit actually fills us up. It, we're called a temple, a house for the Holy Spirit, like an air mattress that's filled with air. And then when it's filled with air, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're able to do what God has called us to do. We're able to, to have the power and the strength of God actually living in us to do all the things that God has called us to do and to be able to imagine things that we could do far beyond what we could do just as a deflated air mattress on a floor, right? We can do so much more. We can hold up so much because of the strength that the Holy Spirit gives us. So I hope that we'll continue to talk about the Holy Spirit and his power as you grow up, Caitlin, um, but that we can all remember the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you live in us, that you give us strength, that you um, are our helper, that you advocate for us, um, that you are just this power that we have within us um, to live before God and to bring him glory. So I pray that you'll help us to be aware and to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to the proclamation of the word this morning, I'd invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word. It is a light to our feet. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and move among us that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verses 5 through 15. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. As I declares of the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the choir and I are very excited. We're wearing red today. This is something that very rarely happens. In fact, once a year, it's almost like Christmas. That's definitely overstating it. But, uh, you know, we were able to wear red today because it's Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday today. And the Holy Spirit, uh, at various points in the Bible, is made manifest by fire. And uh, certainly that first Pentecost, after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended as, as it were, tongues of fire on the heads of the believers. And so we wear red to, to remember that. Uh, Pentecost actually was originally a Jewish holiday. Uh, it's uh, something that we celebrate as Christians, but it was first of all a, a Jewish celebration. And actually, even when you read Leviticus 23, 28, Numbers 28, and Deuteronomy 16, you see how the Jewish people were, were called to three pilgrimages that, they, that the law required them to make to Jerusalem. And this was one of them. To, uh, it, really, it was uh, seven weeks after after the Passover, at which point the, the following day, the 50th day, Penta 50, uh, was the celebration of what was called the first fruits, the, the first of the wheat harvest. And so it was in Jerusalem uh, on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is poured out on the first followers of Jesus. And Peter preaches the gospel to 3,000 people who had gathered there from all over the known world. We are told in Acts 2 that there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. So you get this picture of just this multitude of people who descended on Jerusalem to, to bring their sacrifice, right? The kind of this grain offering. But there's a wonderful, just a wonderful change that happens. Because actually, just not long before this moment, Jesus has offered himself as the atoning sacrifice on our behalf. And in a sense, the, the, the first fruits of that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and brings this new freedom. And instead of the legalism of the law requiring that everyone come from the nations to this one particular point and say prayers in Hebrew, even though they were raised with other languages, right? They are now, what we now see is the people of God, uh, with the Holy Spirit moving upon them, speaking about the wondrous works of God, essentially proclaiming the gospel in every tongue under the sun. It's kind of this outward movement that God is creating because God is doing something new through the work of the Holy Spirit. God is going to move upon his people in a way that, you know, whilst they bring their five loaves and two fish, their, their humble selves, God is going to bring the increase and multiply and work in a supernatural way over and above what they ordinarily can do. And his gospel is going to reach the ends of the earth. And it's really that fulfillment of that text in in Genesis where he says, you know, through the offspring of the woman, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so we see this out of movement beginning here. He is now not only going to be with them, he is not only going to be upon them, but he is going to be in them. And again, this harkens back to the garden, right? In Genesis 2 and verse 7 we read, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. The Hebrew word there for breath is neshama, which can also be translated spirit. And so God breathes into this man made from the dust 
Adam, he, he breathes in his, his breath, his spirit, and that, with, with that action, with the indwelling of his breath, his spirit, this, this man becomes a living creature. He is now fully alive. He is now animated. But of course, then what happens is the fall, right? And, and God's, God's word is, in the day that you eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, that evil is going to essentially corrupt you and bring about death. And at the first reality of that is spiritual, but its outworking is physical. And as with Adam, all, all die because of just that reality that without Christ and the spirit of Christ, we return to the dust. But as we see in, in the New Testament, Paul speaks about this, and we also speak, see this in the book of Hebrews, we are justified by faith. That is, we are, we are connected and reconciled to God through faith. And that was true in the Old Testament as well as the New. But in the Old Testament, it's interesting that when we read about the, the, the Spirit moving upon people, it is, it is, in terms of the majority of those uh, recordings, the fact that the, the, the Spirit moves upon people rather than within them. Like Samson, for instance, in the book of Judges, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces. I don't recommend that. Avoid lions, not a good thing. Uh, but then, you know, in other instances, Moses in uh, Numbers 11, uh, we're told that, uh, you know, he, he, he elects elders to govern the people and says, the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him, Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. By contrast, in the New Testament, when, when Jesus is celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so... This, Jesus is saying this prior to his crucifixion and resurrection, but it's after this that indeed the helper whom Jesus has promised comes upon the people and now becomes an indwelling reality because of the work of Christ, right? Because of uh, his life given as an atoning sacrifice for us, he is our righteousness, and that righteousness we receive, it is appropriated to us through faith. And despite the fact that, as Paul calls us, we, we carry this treasure in earthen vessels, we nonetheless are able to have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to equip us, help us, guide us, teach us for life. There is a difference to the, the Eden reality, and that is we still live in a body that carries the lingering effects of sin. Right? It's something that will ultimately bring about its death. We read about this in verse 10. Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. And so whilst, yes, this body will decay and pass away, it will be brought to life again as a regenerated body in the way that our spirits are now regenerated through the work and presence of the Holy Spirit. But now the question is, how do we live this life now with that reality of the tension between the flesh and the spirit? And Paul is writing about that in this section of Romans today. And we, we live this life because of the work of the Holy Spirit and his partnership with us as we set our minds on the things of the spirit. It says the spirit is life and peace to us. I want to speak about those two realities today, the life and peace that comes with the, you know, with the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. So prior to becoming a Christian, in one sense, we have no conflict, right? We, we kind of just go along with the ways of the world. If the world says, if it feels good, do it, we do. And you know what? It does feel good. And there's no sense of a prick of conscience or what have you, because there, there's no perhaps uh, the, the spirit of truth speaking to us saying, well, that may be good for you, but is that good for that person there? We don't really think too much about that. That tendency to, to look after number one, right? You may have encountered that 
as you were queuing at Six Flags and someone just barges right in front of you in the line. Like, what's that about? Or maybe you're on I-20 and someone just cruises up the hard shoulder. You're like, hold on, what's, what's, what's with that? I think that there's a, there's a reality that we are inherently somewhat self-centered. We live in a culture that is, you know, some of the adjectives we use to describe it is individualistic and narcissistic. We are self-oriented, self-gratification, self-fulfillment is very much the message of our culture. But then, on becoming Christians, we, we sit in the counsel of Christ Jesus who, who tells us things like, well, love your neighbor. And to love your neighbor, you know, and, and do to others as you would have them do for you. Well, that involves a measure of self-sacrifice, right? When you think about how you wanted to be treated, then well, to treat someone else in that way will require some sacrifice on your part. And so we can find ourselves in a, in a kind of a, a tension right, between what the flesh desires, that somewhat self-oriented reality, and, and what the Spirit is calling us to. And actually, Paul speaks to that reality. In the seventh chapter of Romans, the preceding chapter, he says, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. And so in his heart, you can see that Paul, because of the witness and work of the Spirit, is recognizing the good he ought to do. And no doubt, I mean, when you read about his life, he did an amazing good. But there are also this the reality that uh, he is also being pulled in other directions uh, towards sin. And he's just being upfront and honest about that reality. But he, he goes on to say that those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So clearly Paul has an expectation that you can put to death what he calls the misdeeds of the body. Yes, the body has its appetites, right? I think we all recognize that. We all have these bodies and their desires, but they can be brought into submission by the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in collaboration with our spirits as we set our minds on the things of the Spirit, which involves boundaries, which involves disciplining ourselves. It was interesting, earlier this week, I'm not sure if you heard about this, uh, the, the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, uh, released a report. And he was speaking about the profound risk of harm to adolescent mental health that exists in our society. He was urging families to set limits and governments to set tougher standards on the use of social media. I don't know about you, but I've kind of wondered about this for a while. There's, there, there have been some reports and research done that indicates congruence that with the advent of smartphones and social media, the, the psychological health of, of our teens and kids has been deteriorating at a significant rate. I came across a Pew Research finding that said more than one-third of teens said they use social media almost constantly. That's a lot. <laughs> also noting that as social media has risen, so have reports, self-reports and clinical diagnoses among adolescents of anxiety and depression, along with emergency room visits for self-harm and suicidal ideation. The Surgeon General's report also noted that social media platforms brim with extreme, inappropriate, and harmful content, including content that can normalize self-harm, eating disorders, and other self-destructive behavior. Cyberbullying, it says, is rampant. And the advisory added, in early adolescence, when identities and self, sense of self-worth are forming, brain development is especially susceptible to social pressures, peer opinions, and peer comparison. We love to compare ourselves, don't we? Other than just being ourselves. He says they're in a different phase of development, and they're in a critical phase of brain development. Now, that is not to say that social media is all bad. You know, I, I think social media can be good. 
we can have supportive communities of encouragement. I mean, our church has, you know, we have a, a, a Facebook and an Instagram account, right? We try and fill that with good stuff. But, you know, it's, it can be good. But it's fairly clear, I, you know, I, as, I, as I look at this report, it just speaks to this reality of where are we setting our minds? Our, where we set our minds has a big impact on our mental and spiritual. And as you kind of move into the realms of, of self-harm, clearly there, there's a physical manifestation of that reality. The report uh, recommended that families keep meal times and in-person gatherings free of devices. So next time you have everyone over, think about putting those cell phones away. It's an interesting thought. He says, focus on building social bonds and promote conversation. He says, family media plan is worth creating to set expectations for social media use, including boundaries around content. That to me is just, uh, just really highlights the reality of the importance of where we set our minds. And scripture has, has told us, set your mind on the things of the spirit, because the spirit is life and peace. A couple months ago, I was in a, in a Zoom gathering, and so it was a bunch of pastors, and it was really a kind of a, a spiritual uh, formation meeting. Uh, author Alan Fadling was, was leading the, uh, the group. He's written a couple of books, The Unhurried Life, The Unhurried Leader, and he gave us an exercise to do between sessions, and he said, go away, and I want you to take half an hour, sit in silence, and in that half an hour, just jot down in a journal the thoughts that go through your head. I don't know about you, but it's very rare that I actually think about my thoughts. <laughs> but I did. It's a bit of an eye-opener. I am clearly not the Dos Equis guy. You know, not the most interesting man in the world. Actually, a lot of mundane thoughts that pass through my head. We went with several members of our church to a, a prayer gathering up in, up in a church in, 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 I was going to say London, up in Atlanta, and uh, I just remember in that half an hour, just the, some of the things I wrote down, there was this picture at the front of the church, and I just, you know, stuff like, huh, well, that's an interesting picture. Is that a pomegranate? What's a pomegranate doing there? <laughs> and then there was a guy next to me who, who started coughing. Hmm, I hope he's not sick. I hope I don't get sick. And then I kind of I happened to notice that there were scratches on the floor. There were scratches on the floor. A lot of dull, really mundane stuff happens up here, I'm sad to report. Um, then, you know, I'll say it was one of those weeks, we all have those weeks, which uh, there was a lot going on, and I had perhaps dropped one or two balls, and so I'll, there were a couple of somewhat negative thoughts in relation to that. Um, so in the midst of this chaos, right, there was this, uh, this unbidden thought that just kind of dropped in there which came actually from my baptism. Someone gave me a scripture when I was 17, and it's from Isaiah 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Now, of all the things I could have choose to let my mind dwell on, that was my takeaway from that half an hour. Because that's what encouraged me. That's what brought me peace. And that was the Spirit's word to me. Right? Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. As you practice setting your mind on the things of the Spirit, where you focus your time, your attention, your efforts, as you consider the, the fruits of the Spirit, you know, what are the things that inspire those things in your life? Love and joy patience, self-control, humility, goodness, kindness, faithfulness. What are those things? As Paul says to the church in Philippi, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things and the God of peace and the God of peace will be with you. The Spirit brings peace. And the Spirit also brings fullness of life. Uh, last week, me and some guys were doing this uh, study, this discipleship study, Dana Allen's book, Simple Discipleship. And Dana was sharing there in the fourth chapter 
just about what you might call the appetites of the flesh. And so Dana says, I love food. I can relate to that. I do too. And he said, I love the taste. I love the satisfaction. Can anyone else relate to that? You know what I mean? Food. I like to eat. It's good to eat. Uh, he says, I used to see the world as all you can eat, and I would accept the challenge. <laughs> Ever felt like that? But then he kind of, as he kind of continued to write, he said that the words of Jesus challenged him. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he said, I would ask myself, do I crave the word of God the way I crave food? And his prayer to God became, may I continually crave the word of God and be satisfied by it as much as, and preferably more than I am by food. And so he kind of went on to share about uh, the sort of discipline of fasting that he started to, to engage with. Now, I'm guessing, you know, we at different points have done things in Lent to fast. I know I have. I've fasted chocolates or I've fasted coffee, candy, whatever. But often again, that's somewhat about my physical well-being. I know I'll feel better if I stop eating those things. Dana's emphasis was this. He says, I fast to reset my spiritual life and to retrain my soul to find that satisfaction in God rather than in food. So there's almost like a paradox here, right? Fasting is a kind of self-denial, denying the appetites of the flesh, which might feel like dying. <laughs> but actually, when we deny ourselves, there are various ways that that can actually lead to fullness of life. You know, if our life subsists purely in terms of our physical appetites, the reality is that our physical appetites can begin to consume us. They can be doorways to various kinds of addictions. So temperance and self-denial is actually really valuable in life. Sometimes it's important to say no to something. Sometimes it's important to wait. You know, sometimes it's important to work for a reward. And that may be something that comes 10, 20, even 30 years down the road. But we live in this culture of immediacy, right? Got to have it now. And that can get us into all sorts of troubles. We have this huge issue of credit card debt in, in our country, and there are various reasons for that. But some of it is because people just get stuff too soon. And then you kind of, you get all the, all the things you get caught up with and uh, it becomes challenging and may even lead to things like depression and all sorts. It's got to have it now. Temperance and delayed gratification, self-denial, the ability to say no, wait. These are things that can be good and lead to fullness of life now. As we spend time in God's Word, as we are under the guidance and counsel of the Holy Spirit, we can rarely experience fullness of life. How do we overcome the appetites of the flesh? I think firstly, number one, believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. Jesus overcame sin, and because he did and we have a spirit in us, we can too. Don't set the bar low. I think sometimes we just go, well, I'm only human. No. We are called to more. We are not slaves to sin, Paul instructs us. But we, are, we have been adopted. We are sons and daughters of God. And we live into that identity with the help of the Holy Spirit. Believe the gospel. Receive the Spirit. I don't know if you're here today and you've never had someone you know, put their hands upon you and pray for the Holy Spirit's indwelling. But if you have not, you need to do that. Talk to me or James about that and we'll gladly pray with you that the Spirit would come and fill you. And thirdly, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. As we set our minds on the things of the Spirit, we find peace and fullness of life. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, this day when we celebrate and remember the gift of your Holy Spirit 
to us. Father, we thank you for the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God, we know that we need you for this life. Holy Spirit, we pray that you fill us and guide us and help us. We recognize that there is a tension between this, uh, this, the flesh, but also the spirit. And it is our desire to grow in greater measure in the knowledge and love of you. And because of that, and because of the grace you give us, to live into our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God, that we may in greater measure exhibit the very fruits and character of you, Lord Jesus, and your Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, I'd invite you to stand as we sing together hymn number 295, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Please remain standing and join me in the affirmation of faith that's found in your bulletins. <coughs> From the Scots Confession, chapter 12. Our faith and its assurance do not proceed from flesh and blood, that is to say, from natural powers within us, but are the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, whom we confess to be God, equal with the Father and with his Son, who sanctifies us and brings us into all truth by his own working, without whom we should remain forever enemies to God and ignorant of his Son, Christ Jesus. For by nature we are so dead, blind, and perverse that neither can we feel when we are pricked, see the light when it shines, nor assent to the will of God when it is revealed, unless the Spirit of the Lord Jesus quicken that which is dead, remove the darkness from our minds, and bow our stubborn hearts to the obedience of his blessed will. Amen. You may be seated.
take a little bit of extra time. This is a sort of a service we have every couple months, every six weeks or so. We sort of set a time of service where we create a little bit more space for silence, a little bit more space for prayer and opportunities to pray with people and on your own. So I'd encourage you during the offertory, um, and also we saw the prayer prompt or the question on the screen then, this is just an opportunity to um, just look within yourself with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, to ask some of those questions of yourself in the silence um, and to use this space for um, prayer and to take advantage of the prayer um, opportunities that we're going to offer following the service as well. It is a blessing and an, a privilege to be able to give um, to the work of God and his kingdom. We have, um, are doing so many great things through the ministry of FPC, and it's just beautiful to see the fruit of that, um, even in the world and the different missions that we have, and as we celebrated Embrace Grace last week, just to see um, the fruit of our giving and generosity. And so I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward to take this morning's offering, and this is also a time when um, I'd invite you to, to take advantage of those cards that are in the pews in front of you. You can fill out a prayer request, and we have our prayer team that meets faithfully here every Monday um, to lift those requests up, and we also have a whole network of people within the church that receive those requests and pray for them through the week, so please feel free um, to put your prayer requests in the plates as they come as well. So I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to take this morning's tithes and offerings.
Father God, we thank you so much for these gifts that have been given. We pray that you would use them for your glory to multiply your kingdom and your purposes throughout the world. Amen. You may be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Spirit, we remember that you are with us now as we pray to you. You are closer than our very breath. And as we pray, you are not only with us, you are dwelling within us. And that is a truth we praise you for. Thank you for making your home in us. Help us to lean on you, to be led by you, to live with an open awareness of your power at work within us and through us. We pray today that you would move in our world in seen and unseen ways. There are so many places on our globe where the, there is violence, hunger, great need of many kinds. We call to mind some of those places in the silence that follows. We pray specifically for your spirit to provide comfort, provision, and care for those who are vulnerable and in need of healing. Father, we lift up our country to you today. There is so much division, struggle, uncertainty, brokenness among our people. We lift our country before you now in the silence that follows, praying for our leaders, for an atmosphere of grace and peace and truth and wisdom from you to reign in this our nation. On this Memorial Day weekend, we remember the brave men and women who have sacrificed so much, even their very lives, to advance the cause of freedom here and around the world. We bring particular friends or family members who have served, and families who have experienced loss because of the sacrifice of one they loved for our country. We lift them up to you now in the silence that follows. We lift up others who weigh heavily on our hearts this morning. We have friends, family members who are hurting and in need of healing and restoration. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are struggling in grief, for those who need your peace and comforting presence to surround them in this very moment. We lift up those who come to mind before you now in the silence that follows. We thank you for the hope that we have because of Jesus, and we pray now as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now would you stand and sing hymn 751 with me? And I want to call your attention to the, the words in the hymnal. The first and second verse are at the top, the third and fourth verse are confusingly at the bottom, and then the fifth and sixth verse are at the top again. So just keep that in mind as we sing together. So let's stand and sing hymn 751 together. <laughs>
Um, I want to call your attention to um, Glenna and Mike, uh, Matt McDonald, sorry, who's going to be up here in the front um, and available for prayer following the service. So this is just an opportunity to um, come and be prayed for, um, praying for the Holy Spirit's work in you. If there's a particular concern, um, they would love to spend that time with you, and I will also be in the narthex, and feel free to um, seek me out for prayer. I would love to have that privilege of praying with you this morning. So now receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you might abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.